And we're recording. <laughs> um, it's such a pleasure here to have you, Alec, join us. Uh, uh, this is for uh, ETAD 802. And, awesome. and primarily, but I hope it reaches a much wider audience than that. It usually sure. does, right? Uh, that's part yep. of what we're talking about. <laughs> Not confining some of this stuff to little pre preordained little boxes and nice neat little gardens. So any anyway, I just wanted to talk with you about open learning. Frankly, you're the first person I ever talked to who was getting into this. You know that? Uh, you really were. And I know that there were others out there, but you were the one who directed me to them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't know and and at the time I was really just trying to wrap my head around it and how far it could go. Could you talk just a little bit about what you mean by open learning when you're talking about it? Um, okay. Yeah, and I think part of, you know, when we were first talking about this, I think part of why I was drawn to it, it was I was a bit naive, I think, in the sense that I thought all learning should sort of be this way. That, you know, made sense to me in that sense because I wasn't perhaps, uh, you know, I hadn't spent a lot of time in the, in the academy and, and uh, you know, with the universities and so on. So I think I got, I had a different sense going in, especially from, um, you know, some of my readings before that, and I think I've mentioned this many times before, but I think one of the the things that really influenced me, and I think I'll get it'll help me get into the idea of you know what is this open learning thing is um, uh, the notion that uh, you know getting into that whole open source movement because I did some programming and hacking and that sort of thing. Uh, I taught computer programming in Saskatoon for a while, and uh, I was really drawn to this whole open source movement. Um, the whole idea that um, code um, could be free, that we could actually see the code, that it wasn't um, in layers of privacy, I guess, in that sense. And that if you looked at the code, you actually had uh, you had some knowledge into how it was developed, what it meant, what it did, what these things were doing, I guess, in the background, rather than, you know, hiding it. So it was like, in many ways, code to me is sort of the sort of the core of what all this is about because code gives us meaning and, and, and understands um, it kind of gives you the, the blueprints of how where our ideas come from I guess and that I mean that's certainly in the programming sense but I think as a metaphor it's always kind of interesting to look at so um, when I you know I read things like the uh, Cathedral in the Bazaar which is by Eric Raymond who uh, talked about the the you know Linux movement GNU Linux as Stallman mm -hmm. would say but this whole idea that um, that at one point, I mean, even they were quite astonished that something as complex as an operating system could be actually be developed by these sort of tenuous start strands of the internet, like by people who weren't really in close community. And you've done a, a lot of studying of community, but people who barely knew each other that didn't have a real vested interest to be belonged together in that sense could actually create something really complex. And so that to me was really inspiring to me that I could you know, you could create something very complex um, with people you didn't know, and I think that was really kind of a neat, neat idea. Um, and I, I think what what they found from a lot of that um, that time, uh, kind of going back to what I remember of Raymond's um, essay, was that it was less about the technical overcoming of things, but more of the sociological overcoming. Yeah. Um, which I think a lot of us kind of still have to get around that. I think. The idea that we can actually work in groups, and I, and I thought back to even using something like Google Docs with my um, with my faculty, and thinking about if I create a Google Doc and I have other faculty members try to overwrite someone, that whole idea of author and authority and authorship <laughs> is really kind of an interesting thing, and, and no one really wants to overwrite someone else's ideas and. That is really kind of the heart of this whole open learning thing. So getting to the, your actual question, because I just kind of ramble on, is open <laughs> learning to me <laughs> is um, it goes beyond what we see as open educational resources, this idea that you know, content should be free. But to me, open learning goes to the idea that we have these open educational experiences mm -hmm. that should be that we should be able to participate in university courses or K-12 courses in some way, that we make learning visible that we participate in the learning of others, that we contribute to the learning of others. And I think those are really important ideas. Uh, got some in the background? No, yeah, it's just my phone. It's saying, are you there? Are you there? Yeah. No, <laughs> I'm not. I, I, yeah, I, I think that's kind of the, 
to, to me is, you know, the, 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 the ability to make learning open uh, and visible to others is what open learning is all about. And it's not just content, because I don't think content, to me, equates to learning. Content, it doesn't equate to knowledge, it's just content. Um, and I think how we actually create content is more interesting than the content itself. How we actually yeah. develop content, uh, the processes and the relationships that we built to create content is more you know, just just more interesting than content itself. No, not that content isn't interesting. I think it just become. I think it's it's moved from content being the center, as the professor is the content giver, to just basically revealing the process of how knowledge is created. And I think that's what open learning really. That's how it resonates with me, anyway. Yeah, it's almost like tearing away the curtain and seeing what's behind there. Absolutely, it's the wizard behind the curtain. Yeah, really. Many wizards, right? <laughs> I think that that's something that. that um, that I struggled with at first, trying to understand. I'm glad you went back to the open source movement because right. uh, so early on, I would I, I would almost use the terms interchangeably: open source and right. open learning, and it, and they weren't. You know, no, one right. was so product focused, but with the right. cool stuff going on around it. And I think that the open learning, what you're saying is, is that what we're really looking at is the process of learning that goes on around the development of this, and that we we co-create knowledge, we co-create learning opportunities, we co-create all kinds of stuff, right? right? Yeah, to me, it was it was never about Linux. It was about yeah. that we that they created Linux, that many people created this together, and that it was a complex idea. And, you know, as I've often said that, I mean, if we, it, it's, if we can go out and create a lesson plan together, that's not really exciting to me. If we can solve a complex problem, a problem that's worth solving, yeah. with people around the world, then it's exciting. That That's really interesting to me um, because I think that's very difficult to do, especially we have to put away, you know, our contexts, our beliefs. And I mean, even working with a small group that you know very well is hard enough to do, but thinking about, um, you know, doing this over the Internet, you know, voluntarily in most cases, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that, that's a bit harder. And yeah. I think that's really kind of interesting thing, although it can be easier in some cases. Sometimes... We know each other so well, we can't work together very well, <laughs> well together. You I know, hope so that's not you and me, but I, uh, <laughs> I, do, yeah. I do know what you mean. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, isn't it interesting how uh, what you're, one of the things you're alluding to here, I think, is that you're dealing with boundaries. And are right. there any? Would, it, would you say that um, when you say that some learning could be bounded that doesn't necessarily offend you or anything like that, but just that we're talking about a different kind of animal here. Um, what boundaries would you draw around open learning? Are there any? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I think I, I did a diagram a while ago, and I'll just pop it to you at some point. But basically the idea that part of what we do in school and in K-12 learning and as well as universities is that we actually define We help students find these boundaries that I think some conversations are best to have around the table with people we know very well, and some are meant to be U-streamed, um, which I think is really kind of interesting, that, that we have to really look at human fear and vulnerability and, and measure those things. And sometimes, um, I, I think sometimes we have to be very cautious of what we share online. I think some conversations are meant to be, ha you know, happening behind closed doors. I think, I think we have to be very cautious to make everything open um but at the same time sometimes we can be vulnerable in the open and i think that's an okay thing and there's a there's a recent video there's a fourth grader that's going down a ski hill mm -hmm. and you've got to see this video it's um she's at the top of the ski hill and she's talking herself down about the fear and she's just going and she's talking to her parent or someone there and she's like yeah it's 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 only a 60 it's only like a you know, a double a twenty, or you know, you know just a, just a little bit longer, just a long twenty, and she's just talking herself into this, and she's so incredibly vulnerable. And, and I'm thinking about that moment, and she's she's sharing her fear and her vulnerability, and I'm and people who watch this, I've shown this to teachers, and they're just so happy to see her, you know, because she successfully goes down this hill, and by the time she's at the bottom of the hill, she's so incredibly happy and elated, and mm -hmm. she's just you know on top of herself because she's just so excited that she's accomplished this. And I th think sometimes when we, 
do things in the classroom, we might have created something so amazing, but we hold it hostage on the bulletin board. <laughs> that some of this fear and vulnerability is totally gone. And, and sometimes those, things, those moments need to be shared because they're human moments. And so I'm not saying that all things we should share online, but sometimes when we actually do that, there are some amazing things we can learn from those moments. And just to think that we can actually capture those things. And a million plus people watch this video. And to mm -hmm. think that, you know, what's resonating for them is their own sense of fear, that their own sense of overcoming fear, that their own vulnerabilities, that human connection that we all have. And I think that's really an important thing. That's what resonates to someone who watches this. And, and yeah. to see this girl overcome these odds, I think there are people rooting for you um, in that classroom that you don't even know who are rooting for you yet that want to be supportive of your learning. And I think that's one of the things I've done with ECNI 831 is that I try to connect people who are rooting for you, that want you to succeed, who see you develop. Uh, that's the same thing that in grade one, Kathy Cassidy and Moose Jaw does. She has mm -hmm. people come in her and see her grade ones develop from September to, you know, June, and you can see their writing, you know, grow. And mm -hmm. a grade one student will typically have four or 500 hits on their one sentence, you know, essay. <laughs> and, you know, that's not written very well. And when's the last time one of our, you know, undergraduate students had 500 readers. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And you that a great one, you're already being set the stage to, to <laughs> learn in the open. And I think that's mm -hmm. just a wonderful thing. Yeah, yeah so, so, so do I. I'm going a bit about this. <laughs> but, but when we talk about boundaries, then, are we really yeah. just saying it's who has the authority to draw those boundaries and how firm are they? And how can we encourage people to be more open and sharing some of the things that they feel vulnerable about so that they can learn in public and, and find that they, that they can grow in ways that were unanticipated and, and powerful? Is yeah, that part you of know, that? I think, you, know you, you and I have talked, you know, I've, and I've read all of your stuff around community and how important things like trust and forgiveness are in communities. And I think uh, that's one of those things through my Twitter network that I've sort of developed. I, uh, you know, I don't think that everyone in my Twitter network is part of a community in all cases. But for the most part, I, I feel that there are people that I certainly resonate with, and those people are. Um, often those people who help connect with me... Um, uh, you know, through ECNI 831, people who become network mentors, for instance, in my classes, those people who, you know, at, at some, some level, I have a deep trust with them because I'm trusting them with sort of the thing that I do, the thing that I, you know, my students really, you know, this, the learning of my students. So, you know, I, I do sort of maybe perhaps sometimes I feel like it's a blind trust, but pro, you know, pro, the big case, I think people who are really, you know, I, you know, People wouldn't be bothered, you know, someone who really wanted to raise a ruckus, I guess, wouldn't want to be bothered with something as easy as that or something yeah. as, you know, in, in that case. So I'm I kind of, it's been okay. But but I think that, I again, for instance, if I look at the, an example I saw in New Zealand, I think that they are bigger with e-portfolios with kids. Um, there was one school I talked to, I think her name was Lenva Shearing, she was a principal, and what they were doing at an early age, I think they used something like Mahara to develop student mm -hmm. portfolios. Yeah. And those were closed up to, say, equivalent to grade 7 or grade 8. But at some point, the teacher or the school makes the distinction that they decide that we're going to move these over, open, you know, create, create a bit of an openness. But the students have a lot of choice in, in deciding what is open and what's not, and the school scaffolds those choices so they decide you know what is worth sharing at this point and now what's worth that sharing at grade seven is going to be a lot different than what's worth sharing at grade 12 or as an adult i guess and perhaps those dis those decisions won't be the the same but i think that's important is that another one of the things we do with school i think is just to get a a better sense of helping students make choices, wise choices around what's private and public, and sort of understanding the shape and I, I think the shift I think in publics or how we see publics. Um, so that's kind of an important deal, and I really like that idea. Uh, if you move ahead, I mean, you can look at um, what the University of Mary Washington under uh, you know Jim Grimm's yeah. project. That you're going to look at all students having a domain name which is really cool. Like, they're actually looking at buying a domain name for students. So, could you imagine leaving USASC, and, and one of the things that you do for your students is 
is that you have a domain name when you leave, that you have sort of a place on the web, that you become a, a, a digital resident in that sense, mm -hmm. that this is the place that people go to. It's on your business card. Because I think if you, the difference between having a domain name and not having one is that you're really invested in this place. It, it is yours. It's the, it's the, you know, it's the, the cabin with, you know, the, the Schwerer family outside. That's right. <laughs> That's it's, got the, it's got the little thing floating back and forth in the breeze. Yeah. You know, it's got the little turtle or whatever you've got in front of your cabin, <laughs> but you've got that. And you've got a university in this case, which is probably one of the more closed, not, not that one in particular, right. but as an institution, a university is often a very closed, walled kind of garden, promoting a digital portal for their right. students, you know, yeah. a, 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 a way to express themselves more openly. That's kind of a cool overlay, isn't it? When you think, I about love. It. I mean, I love that idea. I think that's one of the things we do with this openness. Is, I, I think openness and identity are so closely tied together yeah. that you can't like everything that I've done. I, I have. I wouldn't have been successful if I wasn't myself open. Like mm -hmm. I don't think you can be successful in developing, say, a MOOC or an open course without the professor having at least some sort of web identity. At yeah. least you know them sharing stuff. You can't all of a sudden you know, publish in nothing but closed journals and, and you know, close all of your work and all of a sudden I'm going to run an open course. I think, I, I don't think you'll get the trust that people need in those spaces. I think, yeah. you know, to really, you know, so, so I think part of what you do, um, the, the professor is certainly interlinked with uh, what you can do or what you're capable of doing with, with your students and with your course, uh, you know, on how open you want it to be and so on. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that you can't make the shift. I just think that, um there's a lot of trust that you have to build to allow this to happen. I think you just yeah. can't say, look, we're going to do an open course, we're going to make it open, but I've done nothing in my life that yeah. is also open. I mean, I think it'd be a hard transition to make in some cases. Can I tell you a quick story about sure. quasi-openness? Yeah. I'd love your comment on it. I've sure. got a blog about this. If I get around to it, I will, I promise. But um, I wrote an article on the understanding that it would be available openly, right? Right. And um, it was. I submitted it. It was proof for, for this. I was doing it for a friend for a special issue. So I, you know, I had a commitment to it. And uh, when the publication agreement came from the publisher, and it was Springer, uh, right. they sent it for, they sent me the transfer of copyright. And I took one look at it and I thought, wow. I thought it was supposed to be open, but it said in the thing, you know, select here for the open option. And I thought, great, okay, that's the one I want. Do you want to transfer your copyright to us and have us own it? Or open. Clicked on that. Guess how much? Yeah, I don't even want to it know. It was 3000 US dollars. I couldn't believe it. Wait, I've got a screen capture. I'll put that in the blog post. But th was... there are a lot of things that are... are, are that seem to be opting into the open language, but not really doing it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Using it as, and I appreciate that they've got a business model and they've got to make money and all that kind of stuff. But I'm not so comfortable with co-opting the language of openness to portray that. I mean, it's really just commercial. Yeah, I think there were, there were people at recently that were quite upset at uh, Pearson doing something similar. I think they were at South by, South by Southwest edu and they had some sort mm -hmm. of openness portal that they were showing off and people on twitter were saying that it was nothing to do with openness at all and, and uh, absolutely the language has been co-opted because open is uh, it's become a valuable in i mean the, the concept itself has become valuable it's 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 gained value and uh, i think more and more people are pushing it but they often don't know what that actually means so um Almost like not, natural products or green products and things like yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely right. You know, and and there's a premium on any of these green yeah. products because they're they're you know they're there's a, there's a premium to pay the extra for you know being you know uh, environmentally friendly and that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. But uh, I mean, if you look at you know the stuff Martin Weller has done around open scholarship or even Dana Boyd, who um, called for I think a couple of years ago she yeah. called for sort of a uh, a boycott on 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 closed access journals. Yeah, it was a bit of a manifesto, wasn't there? It was. I mean, yeah. and the things that she said, I mean, they all make so much sense. If I mean, they, they do make much, a lot of sense, but it's sort of like that whole idea of we having to play the game. Like, new scholars, it, it's understood that they have to publish in particular journals to get tenure, 
but then she basically says that at some point, you know, stop playing the game, don't edit journals, uh, you know, journal articles that um, are, you know, are headed to closed journals, don't work on those advisory boards, uh, don't publish for them, and so on. And, I, you know, that's what I've done, and I'm, I'm quite happy because, I, you know, I'm fairly busy, too, so I get these... Um, you know, every once in a while I get, you know, will you review this? And I'm very happy to say, no, I will not review this. But <laughs> I'm very happy to review things when they're headed towards an open access journal. Um, I, I helped develop an open access journal at the U of R. And, and it went from, honestly, dozens of paid subscriptions to tens of thousands of readings. You know, and that's just to think of how we did that. Now, we had a little bit of a budget. We created a Drupal site. We hired David Cormier from UPI to, to develop the site. Um, we're probably going to switch to OJS at some point. I think we're kind of thinking about that. But OJS mm -hmm. is developed by Simon Fraser. Um, right. And, uh, you know, it's a great system. I think Erodal uses it. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of great, you know, but really, myself, if you think of, you know, $3,000 to release an article, I can set up OJS for absolutely free. And on a server, I could pay Six dollars and ninety-five cents a month with a Canadian hosting company. If you wanted to worry about the Patriot Act and all of that other nonsense, yeah. um, you, you could do that. And I mean, basically, um, our in education journal is hosted for less than ten dollars a month, and that's ten dollars a month and a bunch of other stuff. I've got Moodle on that server. I've got you know a bunch of other <laughs> stuff. But it's just ridiculous that these the only costs are, of course, are the reviewers. But most academics do this for free anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, the reviewers, marketing, which I think for the most part, you can do that yourself, I think, or, or you can start to do it yourself. Um, I don't know what the costs are or where they're coming from other than to run these business models. So I think, to me, um, the big, one of the biggest reasons, I think, for this movement towards open access, I think it's criminal for the most part that we paid as academics um, at this point when, when we have the ability to publish online. That we that this model is available, that we continue to um, give away our copyright or buy it back for three thousand dollars. <laughs> just it just blows my mind. I think we do, we we have to move to a place where it becomes unacceptable. That that I mean, if you look at a, a project like RoarMap, I think mm -hmm. um, RoarMap is the register registry of open access repository mandatory access. Policies. Oh, well it's done. A, it's a, <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> come up with it. <laughs> um, basically, it's, it's, a, it's a list of a lot of libraries are behind it, but other institutions, Canadian and American and I think other parts of the world, that um, have a, a mandatory archiving policy. That there needs to be, if you're going to publish somewhere, that there needs to be at least a copy that, that, that uh, the institution can access. Yeah. And I think that's so incredibly important that you have that pre publication copy available to everyone if you're going to publish, especially when you're being paid by, uh, by public funds. So anyway, that's where my sort of stance is on this. I think we've really got to, you know, go basically creator to consumer, um, and that's it. I mean, no middleman and no money exchanged, and I think that's where I'm at. So do you think I, the part of it is, is that things. do you think that part of the, the reluctance, uh, I mean, we know the usual uh, uh, academic reluctance that's out there, but do you think part of the reluctance is is that people are just now getting used to the idea that the 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 middle people in all of that in that business model are largely irrelevant and in some cases the very models that we've built are are stifling the kinds of communication we can have well i mean the model itself of journals i mean there's so much to sort of rip apart there like we we collect it, articles so that we can create a volume, and we, and we wait for them all to come in, for all of them to be reviewed. Like, I honestly have an article that I did in 2008 that I'm hoping to be published in 2012. That's four years. Okay, that's, that's even... I'm, I was going to tell the story of a two-year yeah. one, but that's yeah, excellent. No, it's got four years, yeah. and now it's going to be in the U of T press, and this was well before I, you know, yeah. signed, you know, myself gave an open access pledge, but it was... You know, going to these reviewers, and then it was reviewed, and then I did an edit, and and then they kind of shopped around for journals, and, and then they thought, you know, U of T Press is prestigious, so they wanted to do that, mm -hmm. and, and so on. And I don't know where it's going to end up or what it's going to do, but I've written two already two um, um, follow ups to this article, to the one that doesn't exist. Like I've basically done Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go back. Get 
release. Like, it's the whole prequel model, I guess. Well, it's so good. Much. I mean, it worked for George Lucas. It can work for you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Yeah, to that grand scale, but I mean, it's it's basically that long, you know, and it's it's just it's it's sad. Yeah, and I and I had you know so thinking of that, I mean, you know, and, and so that that process of how we actually um, like I really like I think the, the thing that's most important to me is the peer review process, and I think it could be done a lot better, but I think it's the thing that we need always will need in academic publishing. I think there's a lot of other metrics and things that we can do better with it, especially with social media metrics and perhaps likes and favorites. I'm not sure exactly how that would look, but I think there is something there that we can certainly do a lot yeah. better. Yeah. Um, but in some know, models, of, we're even challenging that notion of what is a peer. Because right, yeah. you have some fantastic critique that you can get uh, in an open environment, but we've been we've been... Uh, fairly confined in our in our interpretation of what what a peer is, and and I'm finding some of the best critique I get comes from people who don't have a, a bunch of initials behind their names. You know, absolutely, yeah. And, and I think that, that's really important. How, who do we allow to be our peers? You know, what is the uh, the process? Who who what is the process or the people that are behind the process allow to be peers? Who who and 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 how was this? process actually being done. I still think it's the most important part, but you're right, in, and in redeveloping what that actually means, what it means to be peer review or our peers and so on, yeah. is really going to be an important um, item. But in terms of withholding knowledge, I just don't get that. Like, why can't, why can't the volumes be put together later, you know, mm -hmm. in that sense? Like, why don't we just bring this all together? These are articles, they do fit this sort of book, but we bring it all together when they're ready to go. I mean, I, mm -hmm. that just nev never made much sense to me in terms of withholding knowledge because it's not doing any good. And, you know, one of the things that really hit home for me, my uh, not quite two-year-old daughter, she had um, pneumonia. So I was in the hospital yeah. and um, uh, and I, d I direct messaged on Twitter a pharmacist that I know and someone I actually trust. I wouldn't just DM any pharmacist on Twitter, especially when it comes to my daughter's health. And so she was prescribed an uh, antibiotic and so I talked to this pharmacist, and so she DM'd me a paper on, uh, you know, the side effects and all these other things. And, and then I tried to access the journal, but, of course, I didn't have access to it. You, Regina doesn't have a med, journal, you know, med yeah. school, and, and so I couldn't get access to that. So I talked to someone at the University of Victoria who had this guest access so I could use this. And so I used my network and my leverage and, you know, um, you know my connections to be able to access this. But I know that the average parent wouldn't have access to this knowledge, um, wouldn't be able to find, you know, pull those strings. And if you wanted to buy this article, it ranged, and depending on where you bought it, was like a few hundred dollars, you know, yeah. get it to like 20 or something. But still, to be able to do that sort of thing and have those connections, and it just struck me, like, why isn't this information available to every parent? That our health information is not available, that things that we need, and, and, and I, I, mean, I still believe in, you know, you know, education journals are as important in many ways, but I think in that particular case, it really just sort of, like, why doesn't the public have access to things that they want to get access to? Yeah. And uh, if, if we really believe that education is a public good, why don't we have these things that are so important to us as academics, the content, the articles, the things that we are required to create, why isn't that available to more people? And I think that that alone is enough for an open access mandate, that we should be able to serve the public in this particular way. That we, the toils of our research are available to everyone in our country. And you know what? This just struck me from, from your description of that, that maybe one of the most important things that we're accomplishing, or that you're accomplishing specifically, uh, by promoting open learning uh, in K-12 settings too, is that we're preparing uh, the students of today for an open world where they expect to be able to answer their own questions, find answers, uh, leverage their own social networks to find out uh, things, yeah. Yeah, develop personal learning networks that are meaningful and, and, and that will endure. Yeah. Does that make sense? Maybe uh, that's absolutely. one Absolutely. No, it does. I, and I think that's so incredibly important. Like, if I didn't have those connections, I couldn't get, I mean, I could pay for it. That's, that's the easy. I think that's the one things that publishers have always done well is that if you want something, you just pull out your credit card and you can buy it or, you, can, you know, your, or hopefully your libraries uh, purchased it for you. And so it becomes a sort of a seamless transaction. Now, you know, organizations like 
the directory of open access journals are stepping up to sort of catalog and organize these things, and I'm sure this will be more important. But I guess if anything that you know a closed journal system would serve is hopefully you know the searchability of this content and of course the quick access if you can pay. Yeah. But but I think you're right. I think the next step is really making this so that it seems as, as illogical to any academic as well as to the public that this just does not make sense that it it's just a model that needs to die that it's some <laughs> you know that it needs to go we away. need to take it behind a barn and shoot it <laughs> we do we do it, it's just not fair to anyone um, I don't think for the most part what you know for I'm sure your article was great <laughs> absolutely <laughs> but three thousand dollars to to you know how would you ever recoup that. You know, oh, as the author, right? Yeah. Couldn't. Couldn't. Could. And I was caught on the horns of a moral dilemma. Do I pay $3,000 or and or do I pull this yeah. and uh, uh, not live up to an agreement and a promise I'd made to a friend and a colleague? And yeah. so I actually got caught in that, and I found out that my morals weren't worth $3,000. <laughs> so I made an exception. Yeah. <laughs> but well, That's you it. And, and, you know, like, and, uh, you know, You've done an amazing job with your publications and so on, and you know I've I've used your text. I've done so much with yours, but I think things have changed so dramatically that that model, I mean, where it did serve its purpose yeah. and that it allowed academics to be read, the model just in an abundance when there's an abundance of information and anyone can publish. When we are truly at a participatory, you know, media type society, that that model has just it should wither away. Mm-hmm. I mean, Napster changed everything, really, to me. If you, if you look at how people, I mean, sociologically decided that anything is, I mean, you can get anything. You can go to Scribd and find entire books. And, yeah. and not saying, you know, most of the stuff is illegal, that you can do that sort of thing. But at some point, um, people realized that if they wanted some access to something that they could. And then, I mean, you know, then rethinking, you know, Lessig comes around with the Creative Commons and people start to rethink that all rights reserved is no longer good enough, that mm-hmm. some rights reserved is better. But if you think of intellectual property itself, it's, you know, it's, it's, built, it's based on this faulty regime that, um, that if some intellectual property is good, that more is better. It just doesn't make sense. Okay. I mean, it's, it's Really, all of that has been based on that, and it's not because at some point copyright was meant to uh, preserve creativity, to preserve. I mean, there there was some sense at some point, but when we get to the point when, in an abundant society, and, and especially when you start to to bring in this idea of gift economies, I think copyright just doesn't make the same amount of sense uh, that it used to. And I'm hoping that you know copyright keeps up with a lot of this stuff. I'm, I'm a bit worried about some of the things coming down in Bill C30. I think it is. I forget which. Now, but uh, I mean, some of it looks really great. I mean, if you look at um, ideas around uh, having a real fair dealing type um, educational um, exemption, exemption, yeah. I mean, that sort of thing. I mean, they've had in the in the in the U.S. They've had a fair use and an exemption for education and uh, forever, uh, for, <laughs> practically as well. You know, those sort of things yeah. forever they haven't had that. But when you start getting into things like digital locks, if you break a digital lock, that everything else just doesn't matter that you've broken the law that gets really scary and i don't know why that needs to exist but yeah, yeah. anyways yeah. Yeah. well it's a, you know lots of complex complexities here and yeah, yeah. I, i'm not sure i think we strayed from the question a few times but, but you know what i think that's exactly <laughs> what we needed to do with this because not only is this about open learning it's an open topic that right. literally yeah. goes in all directions simultaneously and I think that's what's really exciting about it. I think we're we're really on the front end of a lot of social change, right? And how this feeds into that social change, and how how it contributes to what we're seeing, and trying to understand, aren't we? I mean, all of us are trying to understand what's really going on with our world now. This yeah. is this is part of that, and I think it's it's part of the conversation that that we all need to have around this. And I sure appreciate you spending the time. Well, you, where are you right now? Are you in the UK? Are you in Greece? Or where are I'm you? I'm in Plymouth, actually, yeah. Are yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I barely left the hotel room, but I'm working on a, a presentation for uh, for uh, the Plymouth e-learning conference coming up uh, in a couple, or 
tomorrow, I think it starts, actually. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll let you go and finish your preparation, Alec. I, listen, I can't thank you enough. And, and just for the record, I don't think I said it on the top end. This is Dr. Alec Koros from the University of Regina, one of my favorite people, <laughs> one of the best colleagues I've ever had, and just one of the best friends I've ever had. So this is just, it, it's great of you to come on and share. I mean, here you are a million miles away in a different time zone, Uber EST, and... <laughs> Yeah, yeah BST, but still not as bad as EST, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But All right, thanks, Ben. Thank you, Alec. Have a great uh, have a great conference while you're over there. I will. Yeah, I'll thanks. Talk to you when you get home. Yeah. Take care. Bye, buddy.